part of his eternal word. Well, what we see in verse 3 is what I want us to focus on initially. It says, when King Herod heard that these magi were looking for the king of the Jews, it said he was greatly troubled, or he was greatly distressed. Now, it's fascinating to me because Jesus had done nothing more at this point than be born. All he had done at this point was be born. And look at the incredible impact he is already having. The entrenched systems of the time. Those with human authority, those with human power, those structures that had been in place, they were already feeling threatened. They were already greatly disturbed. And Jesus had done nothing at this point except be born. He hadn't preached a sermon. He hadn't performed a miracle. He hadn't had a confrontational argument with those who opposed him. He had simply been born. And yet, in the response of Herod, we see the incredible power, the incredible glory, the ultimately unknowable significance of Jesus simply being born. Jesus being willing. Jesus being willing to come into this world just as each one of us came into this world, being conceived in our mother's womb and ultimately being born. Just in Jesus' willingness to do that, all of the entrenched human systems of power and authority and control were trembling. They were greatly distressed because the eternal Son of God had arrived. And we know that he was not going to leave anything the same. The entire course of human history had just changed forever. Everything that had proceeded up to the point of the birth of Jesus Christ was not going to remain the same. The eternal Son of God had come into the world. And everything, everything was going to be different. And those evil men who were holding on to their authority, who were ruling over people with an iron fist, who were bringing about evil purposes for their own selfish desires, they were incredibly troubled and distressed. Because Jesus had come. That's what we see in Herod. So even in a wicked man's wicked response, we ultimately see the glory of Christ. This evil king, primarily ruling selfishly for his own selfish gains, who simply wanted to maintain and hold his own power, his own little corner of authority on this planet, was troubled when Jesus was born. Why? Because no one like Jesus, had ever been born before. No one like this newborn king of the Jews had ever threatened, entrenched in power before the way Jesus was doing, simply by being born. Let's continue to read, picking it up in verse 7. It says, Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. And they had heard, after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child 
with his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of frankincense or incense and of myrrh. So again, let's pause there. So what we see here is a central theme of worship. A central theme of worship. Remember when the Magi appeared in verse 2, they said, Where is this one who has been born the king of the Jews? We have come to worship him. We have come to worship him. And of course, what we see in verse 11, when they finally find the newborn Jesus, that's exactly what they do. They bow down, they fall down in his presence, and they worship him. And as part of their act of devotion, as part of their act of worship, they give him these incredibly costly gifts, gold and incense and myrrh. In the ancient world, these would have been the gifts of kings, the gifts of royalty, things that only a handful of people could have afforded. But we see the sincerity of their worship. We see the genuineness of their worship. They'd travel, we don't know how many hundreds, maybe even over a thousand miles to come. And their only reason for coming, their only reason for coming was to worship. That's why they were there. They weren't there to, you know, conduct business transactions. They weren't there to see distant relatives. They weren't there to enjoy the amazing five-star hotels of Bethlehem. They were simply there to worship. And their worship was sincere. And their worship was genuine. Now we see the evil King Herod picking up on that. Remember, he felt greatly threatened. He felt greatly troubled and disturbed hearing that a potential rival to his power and authority had been born. So as evil people often do, he started to devise a plan of deception. And so in verse 8, he says, hey, look, when you guys find him, let me know and tell me where he is, because I also want to go and worship him. Herod uses the exact language, the exact motivation of the Magi to deceive and to cover up his evil intentions. And so another reason why Herod is included in the birth narrative of Jesus is to remind us that this is what the world does. This is what the world does. The world deceives. The world says yes, but means no. This is what the world does. And the world does this to further their own selfish purposes. You see, Herod was tripped up in his own wisdom, in his own way of thinking. He actually thought that he could deceive these magi, convince them that he also wanted to worship. And, of course, once he heard where Jesus was, would go there and do away with this would-be rival. But as sons and daughters of the King of Kings, as those who are in this world and not of it, there's a couple things that we need to be aware of. First of all, we need to be aware that the world is deceptive. We need to be aware that oftentimes when the world says yes, it means no. And when the world says no, it means yes. Just think of how enticing sin can be. That's incredibly deceptive. Incredibly deceptive. Think of that sin that causes you to stumble more than any other. Think of that sin that really, really trips you up. Look at how enticing and how appealing and how satisfying you think that sin is going to be. Deception. This is what the world does. Because as soon as we engage in that sinful behavior, that sinful thought, that sinful action, we end up with a mouth of gravel. We end up empty. We end up completely, completely feeling the weight of the emptiness of that pursuit. But what hooked our heart in the first place? Deception. 
Deception that that sinful activity, that that sinful behavior, that that sinful thought would actually satisfy. Would actually meet that deep need that each of us have in our hearts for one thing or another. Deception. We need to be aware. We need to be aware that this is how the world operates. And because we are aware that this is how the world operates, we need to do everything we can to be the opposite. We need to be people of the light. We need to be people of the truth. When we say yes, we mean yes. When we say no, we mean no. We are not trying to come across a way that we are not. We are not trying to live deceptively to advance our own purposes. We need to be people who are honest and transparent and straightforward. Deception is how the world operates. We are to live differently in this world. We are not to be like Herod, deceiving to try to accomplish and further our own selfish desires. We absolutely are aware that is how the world operates, but that is not how we are to operate. Remember Jesus in the Gospel of John, it says, men love darkness because sin is hidden in darkness. But Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. He brings us into that light. He brings our behaviors, our thoughts, our actions, our words. He brings those things into the light. Why? Because he loves us. Because he loves us. He says hiding and secrecy and deception, that's the way of the world. That's the way of King Herod. That's not the way of my daughters and sons. And so he wants us not only to be aware that this is how the world attempts to trip us up is through deception, but he wants us to live completely differently, to live as transparent, honest, truthful people. Now, of course, of course, we have all fallen in that area. I've fallen hugely in that area. But there is grace. There is grace. And that's what we continue to live on. So Herod is crafting this evil plan. Let me try to deceive the Magi. Let me try to trick them into telling me where this newborn king of the Jews can be found. Let's pick it up in verse 12. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they, the Magi, returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. I love the incredible simplicity and straightforwardness of verses 12 and 13. As you're reading this account as we are today, particularly looking at Herod as one of the characters of this account, look again at verses 12 and 13. The absolute powerful simplicity of those verses. An angel of the Lord told the Magi, don't go back to Herod. And they didn't. An angel of the Lord told Joseph, take the baby and the mother and go to Egypt. And he did. Just like that, the worst plans of the enemy are completely frustrated are completely frustrated. Because what is being shown us here is nothing is hidden from the Lord. Nothing is hidden from the Lord. One of my favorite accounts that also reinforces this is found in 2 Kings. 
Some of you are aware you saw the email tomorrow. We're going to start reading Kings. We're going to be reading First and Second Kings over the next month and a half. But in Second Kings chapter 6, the king of Aram continues to plot ambushes and attacks against the king of Israel. And he is constantly frustrated. And he is constantly being thwarted in his efforts to wage war against the king of Israel. And the king of Aram is furious. And the king of Aram calls his counselors to him and says, Which one of you is betraying me to Israel? And one of his advisors says, King, it, it's none of us. It's the man of God. Not even named in this passage, but it's the, the prophet Elisha. They say, his counselor says to the king of Aram, It's the man of God. Even what you whisper in your bedroom is told to him. And so every time the king of Aram is setting an ambush, every time the king of Aram is trying to catch the armies of Israel, Elisha simply says to the king of Israel, Hey, king, don't go that way. Because the king of Aram is waiting for you. And over and over and over again, the plans of the king of Aram to destroy the armies of Israel is completely frustrated. What you whisper in your bedroom is told to the man of God. Herod's most evil thoughts, Herod's most evil scheming was completely laid bare before the Lord. Nothing is hidden. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13. Again, just an incredible verse that summarizes this amazing principle. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Nothing was hidden from the Lord. Herod's evil intentions, Herod's deception, it was not hidden from the Lord. And so all the Lord did was simply warn the Magi, don't go back to Herod. And they didn't. And all the Lord did was simply warn Joseph and said, take the son and the mother to Egypt. And just like that, just like that, the plans of the enemy are completely frustrated and completely made invalid. And so we are reminded of just how foolish it is to try to scheme against the Lord. We are reminded just how foolish it is to try to outwit the Lord, to try to outthink the Lord, to try to outscheme the Lord. It's absolute idiocy. He is the God who sees everything. He is the God who knows everything. He is the one before whom all of creation is laid naked and bare. What, what foolishness to think there's something going on in his universe that he is unaware of. What, what absolute foolishness to think that there is something happening that he has turned a blind eye to. In fact, Psalm 2 gives an incredible summary of this absolute idiocy and foolishness. Let's just read the first couple of verses of Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2 verse 1. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth like King Herod. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. About a thousand years before King Herod was even born, God was laying his plan bare. God was laying his plan completely bare. How foolish and idiotic King Herod was to take a stand against the Lord, to take a stand against the Lord's anointed one, even as an infant, the baby Jesus. How foolish it was to stand in opposition to him. Verse 3. What do they say? They say, let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. You see, the unbelieving world sees the incredibly present hand of the Lord as a burden. We see it as a blessing. 
The constant, present hand of the Lord, protecting, leading, guiding, directing, sustaining. For us, it's a hand of blessing. For the world, it's a hand of cursing. Let's try to break the hand of the Lord off of us. It's a hand of slavery. It's a hand of bondage. You see how just completely twisted and corrupted the world's way of thinking is. Let us break their chains. Let us throw off their fetters. And how does the Lord respond? How does the Lord respond? Is he, is he worried? Is he fretting? Is he anxious? Is he nervous? Oh no, my enemies are plotting against me. Oh no, my enemies are plotting against my son Jesus. And he's just a baby. Look at how helpless he is. Look at how vulnerable he is. He's just a baby to Mary and Joseph. Is that how the Lord responds? No, in verse 4. The one enthroned in the heavens, he laughs. He laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. And then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. The Lord is not worried. The Lord is not concerned. Let the enemies of the Lord and the enemies of his Christ do their worst. God is not anxious. God is not afraid. God is not intimidated. God is not even the least bit concerned. He laughs. He laughs. Really? Really? Is that all you have? Is that the best you can do? And are you so foolish to actually think you can stop me? God had just sent his son into this world. Do you really think he was going to let puny King Herod stop him? Do you really think the God of the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land was going to let stupid, puny King Herod stop his eternal plan of redemption? What an idiot Herod was. And in 4 BC, he died. He passed from the annals of the living and stepped into eternity. I'm sure very, very regretful of the poor decisions he had made. The Lord is always a trillion steps ahead of his enemies. Ten trillion, infinitely ahead. He's the God who sees everything. He's the God who knows the beginning from the end. He's the God who was there eternally before creation began, before time even started, before he even spoke the universe into being. God is. Do you really think he's going to be outwitted by any of his enemies? Do you think anyone who stands against him, do you think anyone who plots against him or against his son Jesus is going to prevail? I mean, do you see the absolute idiocy of even for a moment adopting that point of view? And yet how many of us, when we're scared, when we're doubting, when we're afraid, how many of us unfortunately let that thought start to be entertained in our minds. That's why Herod is included in the birth of Jesus, to remind us that the enemies of God are powerless to stop him from accomplishing his purposes. Why is Herod included? To remind us that in their greatest efforts to deceive, to connive, to trick, they are ultimately powerless to stand against the Lord. The next part of the story is incredibly sad. Picking it up in verse 16, it says, When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and in its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. An incredibly, incredibly sad aspect of the birth of Jesus. You see, Herod realizes that he has been outwitted. Not so much outwitted by the Magi. That's obviously how Matthew records it, and certainly that is true. But ultimately, Herod had been outwitted by the Lord. Herod had been outwitted by the Lord. And at that point, he actually had an opportunity to bow the knee to the king of the Jews. 
to bow the knee to the king of heaven and earth, to humble himself. We may think of King Nebuchadnezzar, who had vastly more power than King Herod, ruled over a vastly greater empire than King Herod. And he, in fact, was humbled by the Lord. And in fact, what Daniel records for us had an incredible measure of repentance when he realized that there is a king and it's not me. There is a king who sits in the heaven and it's not me. And even someone as wicked as King Nebuchadnezzar had a measure of repentance in response to that. So King Herod, he had an opportunity, realizing that he had been outwitted by the Magi, ultimately outwitted by the Lord, he had an opportunity to bow his knee to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But instead, as the world often does, he responded with rage. And so again, we see part of why Herod is included in the birth narrative. Because again, the response of rage, that's the world's response. When the world doesn't get its way, when the world has been outwitted, when the world realizes it's fighting a losing battle against the Lord of heaven and earth, oftentimes, instead of bowing the knee, the Lord responds with rage. And that's what King Herod does. He responds with rage. Now again, the Lord shows us this as daughters and sons of the king so that we are aware of it. So that we are aware of the fact that rage is a strategy of the world. Rage is a strategy of the enemies of God and of his Christ. We need to be aware of that. We are living in a culture that is becoming increasingly comfortable with rage. We are living in a culture that is becoming increasingly okay with absolute fits of furious rage. That is the way of the enemies of God. And so not only must we be aware of it, we ourselves must also live exactly the opposite. There is a place for righteous anger, absolutely. And that's a whole nother lesson, a whole nother sermon. But sinful rage is the way of the world. There is no place for that in the people of God. So Herod doesn't give up. We wish he had. Herod doesn't bow the knee. We wish he had. He intensifies the attack. And he says, if I can't outwit my opponents, if I can't outsmart them and deceive them, then I will resort to full-on violence and murder. And that's what he does. He calculates from the time that the Magi gave him from when the star had first appeared, and he figures, I'm going to kill every boy in Bethlehem and the surrounding area, two years old and younger, in an effort to completely obliterate this rival who had been born. And so we see, again, this is the way the world responds. The world tries to sweet talk, the world tries to smooth talk, the world tries to deceive to get its way, and when that fails, the world resorts to full-on anger and rage. And yet we see that even in the midst of that, the plans of God are not thwarted. The plans of God are not undermined. It creates a world full of sorrow. It creates a world full of loss. It creates a world full of distress. But it never, ever, ever stops the purposes of God. And I want to just end this portion by just reading the first phrase of verse 19. We've already made passing reference to it. The first phrase of verse 19, and King Herod died. That's it. And King Herod died. And Jesus didn't. Jesus was protected. And Jesus grew into boyhood. And then manhood. And then was anointed by the Holy Spirit. And had three, three and a half years of incredible, life-changing, world-altering ministry. And then on his terms, he went to the cross. And no one took his life from him. He laid it down. And on the third day, 
He rose again. Where's Herod? He's nowhere to be found. Where's Jesus? Seated at the right hand of the Father. You see why Herod is included? To show just how powerless and puny and pointless and empty the worst assaults of the enemies of Christ really are. That's why Herod is included. Let's turn to Revelation 12. We got a couple more minutes of attention here. Yeah? It's not even 12 o'clock. Revelation chapter 12. This is my favorite part of this story. Some of you are familiar with Revelation chapter 12. Remember, Revelation is a book that reveals truth in a, in a fairly different way. It doesn't, doesn't reveal truth in a way that we are oftentimes used to Scripture revealing truth. It does it through amazing vision. Wild, wild visions. And in Revelation chapter 12, we're going to see three characters described for us. We're going to see a woman. We're going to see a dragon. And we're going to see a son. Revelation chapter 12. It says, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. What an incredibly glorious woman. In fact, her glory is the glory of creation. Her glory is the glory of the sun and the moon and the stars. We don't have time to completely unpack right now who she is. We'll get to that in a minute. But what I want us to see is this woman is glorious. She's unlike any other woman that has ever appeared before. Because creation itself is lending its glory to her as she radiates that glory of the creation of God. But we also see that she is pregnant. So already, hopefully, we're seeing a connection. Because Mary had been pregnant. And there's a strong connection now between what we're reading in Revelation 12 and what we have been reading in Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2. So the woman is starting to cry out in pain because she is about to give birth. All of you women who have given birth, you may acutely remember those pre-birth pangs that we as men will never understand. But she's starting to cry out in pain because the time of her birthing has come. But let's pick it up in verse 3. It says, Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. It's Matthew 2, right? So what we are told in Revelation 12 is what was really going on in Matthew chapter 2. You see, King Herod was just the human puppet. King Herod was just that flesh and blood individual that was born and lived and breathed and ate and died. And he was a foolish, stupid, human opponent of God and his Christ. But really what was going on behind the scenes was Revelation chapter 12. You see, what was unseen to the natural eye when Herod was making his efforts to kill the infant Jesus, there was a ferocious red dragon, absolutely hideous, evil, intimidating, powerful, he was the one that was ultimately orchestrating the attack. And we see what his intentions were. The moment that the child was to be born, his desire was to devour the child. You see, so we are reminded that the human characters that come on the stage and then leave at their death, and come on the stage and leave at their death, they are certainly part of the adversaries and opponents of God and his Christ. But the ultimate opponent is the dragon. The ultimate opponent is Satan, who from the garden till the end has been orchestrating everything he can to undermine and destroy God 
and his Christ and his kingdom. But of course, we know how Matthew 2 ends with Herod being completely frustrated. So we know how Revelation 12 is going to end with the dragon being completely frustrated. Let's read verse 5. It says, She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Jesus is ruling the nations. All of them. Not just America. Jesus is ruling all of the nations with an iron scepter. And where is he? And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Jesus is seated on the throne of God. All authority, all power, all dominion have been given to him. You see, it wasn't just the efforts of Herod to destroy the infant Jesus that were completely frustrated by God. It's the efforts of Satan, the ferocious red dragon, to obliterate Christ in his entirety that is also completely frustrated by God. Satan is fighting a losing battle. He's fighting a battle he cannot win. Why does Satan rage? Why does Satan conspire against the Lord and against his anointed one? Put Satan in Psalm chapter 2. What does the Lord do in response to Satan's attacks? He laughs. He scoffs. God has no rival. God has no equal. God has no worthy adversary. There is God and there is the entirety of the rest of creation. That's how scripture portrays it. That's how scripture portrays it. God completely undermines Satan in his efforts to stop God from building his kingdom. But verse 6, it says, The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. Now, we don't have time to begin to completely unpack Revelation. But this woman is not just Mary. She's far bigger than Mary. And in fact, later in the book of Revelation, we're going to be introduced to another woman. A woman who will be referred to as the Bride of Christ. I believe this woman represents the people of God. I believe this woman represents the people of God. Let's jump down to verse 17. It says, The drag... Then the dragon was enraged. Sound like Herod? Who was really standing behind the rage of Herod? It was the dragon. You see, the dragon realizes he has been frustrated in his efforts to destroy the child. And he has been frustrated in his efforts ultimately to destroy the woman. There's a lot of Revelation 12 we're skipping. It says, but then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. You see, this woman continues to give birth. This woman continues to have children. This children. The children of this woman are those who obey the Lord and have a testimony for Jesus. This woman is the church. This woman is the community of believers, both old and new. And what I want us to see here is that first and foremost, a place is prepared for her. It says a place was prepared for her for 1260 days. We won't get into that today. But a place is prepared for her where she can be nurtured, where she can be nourished, where she can be protected. That is what is prepared for her. As the church of Jesus Christ, we have to understand, first and foremost, a place has been prepared for us. We're in the hand of the Lord. We're in the hand of the Lord. We are in the hand of the Lord. The place that God has prepared for us. A place where we are nurtured. A place where we are protected. A place where we are provided for. We can't let that truth escape us. But what do we also see? The dragon is still at war. The dragon is still at war. And who is he making war against? Us. He's making war against us. We can't deny that. We may not want to hear that. We may not want to embrace that. But it's absolutely what is going on. 
He is absolutely destined to fail. We know where he ends up, but until that day comes, he is waging war against the disciples of the Lord. He's waging war against us. And he will do everything that he can to destroy us and to destroy the image of Christ in this world. Now, he will fail. He absolutely will fail. And we are in a place where ultimately he cannot touch us. Remember, what does Jesus say about this? He says, don't fear the one who can destroy your body and after that do nothing more. He may kill some of us. We don't want to hear that, but he may. He may kill some of us. But if he kills us, has he won? No. If he kills us, he's lost. Because we go to be with the presence of the Lord and the church continues. The church continues. Herod is gone, but the church continues. All the enemies of the Lord, flesh and blood, they come and they rage and they pass away and they're gone, but the church continues. Don't fear the one who can destroy your body and after that has no more power over you. Fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Fear the Lord. Ultimately, we are untouchable. Ultimately, we are untouchable because the worst that Satan can do is take our lives. And if he takes our lives, we win. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And when we adopt that attitude, we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony and not being afraid even to the point of death. You see, once you no longer fear the enemy's worst weapon against you, he is powerless. <laughs> He is powerless. He comes at us with fear and anxiety and stress and all these other things. But once you realize in Christ, all of that is defeated. All of that is, is, is taken care of by the blood that was shed for us. The enemy is powerless. And you know what it does? It makes him furious. But ultimately, he cannot touch us. Because who we are and what we have is who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ. And that he cannot take away. So church, we are in a battle. We are objects of warfare. But ultimately, ultimately, our enemy can't touch us. And the more we understand what Christ has done for us, the more we understand who we are in Christ, the more we realize just how pointless the attacks of the enemy are against us. So this is why Herod is included. A villain? Yes, absolutely. Wicked in his intentions? Yes, absolutely. So why include him in the birth of Jesus? Because it puts the redemption of Christ on display. It puts the power of Christ on display. It puts the wisdom of Christ on display. It puts the absolute assurance that we have in Christ on display. The enemies are simply the foil to bring greater glory to God. <laughs> the very thing that Satan hates the most, bringing glory to Jesus. Ultimately, all of his efforts, that's all they do. Because they only highlight just how powerful Jesus is. They only highlight just how glorious Jesus is redemption is. So the very thing that Satan hates the most, he's actually doing in his assault against Jesus and his followers. Isn't that the wisdom of our God? Isn't that the wisdom of our God? How foolish ever to think that we could outthink him, that we could outsmart him, that we could deceive him. How foolish. So instead, let's continue to do what we do. Bow the knee to him. Worship him. Trust him. Realize that we have an enemy. Realize he's waging war against us, but realize he's ultimately powerless. Realize that his worst weapons have been defeated by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the freedom that Jesus purchased for us. That's the life that Jesus purchased for us. In faith, let's live it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much for giving us the opportunity today to consider again uh, the birth narrative, particularly from Matthew chapter 2, 
And thank you, Father, for giving us an opportunity to, to be reminded of your infinite wisdom, of your infinite power, of the unstoppable purposes in your heart that even the devil and hell itself are powerless to undermine. We thank you for that. Father, we realize that we are still in a war. And we realize the world hates us because the world hates you. And we realize the enemy hates us because the enemy hates you. But we realize, Lord, that in you we are victorious. And in you we ultimately cannot be touched. And we thank you for that. And God, for those weapons that the enemy uses, particular weapons against each of us that can be so effective, whether it's fear or doubt or anxiety or stress or worry or discouragement, those incredibly effective or apparently effective weapons of the enemy. Remind us that you have defeated them all. And that in Christ, we are free from those plagues. That in Christ, we are free from those things that would seek to trip us up. And so help us to live, Lord. Help us to live a life of faith. Help us to live a life of freedom that radically trusts you is aware of the time in which we live, but chooses to live for you in the midst of it. Because, Lord, as we continue to pray for you to touch this world, one of the most powerful ways that you touch this world is through us. Is through us. And as we endeavor, Lord, to live each day for you, as we endeavor, Lord, to walk in these truths, we will see you touch the world in incredible ways. And so we thank you. Thank you for this time to consider these truths together. And Jesus, it's in your name and your name alone that we pray these things. Amen.